dear guests, colleagues and students, on behalf of the Institute of Contemporary Arts and Media at the Department of Art History of the Catholic Private University Linz, it is a great honor to welcome you all to the today's lecture of Joanna Varsha. It is the second event within our global art history lecture series, which the department of art history offers every two years as part of the teaching program. Following an international shift within both the art world and the academic discipline of art history, this format has responded to the need to enlarge and criticize our Western or Eurocentric perspective. This included discussions of the term globalization itself, as well as its effect on the possibilities of a new or alternative way of teaching and researching art history. This winter term, Maximilian Lena and I have taken on the task of conceiving and organizing this event by focusing on the practice of curating, among other things, because this aspect offers an appealing overlap between theory and practice. As we have seen at our first lecture with Jennifer Walklate, we invited scholars and today we have a curator talking directly about her practice within a globalized art world. Before I now briefly introduce Joanna Varsha, I would like to again express my gratitude to the entire team at the university for their support and the Gunther Rombold Private Foundation for its important sponsorship. Moreover, I would like to point out that the lecture series is part of our new project called Wir stellen aus, in English we exhibit. It is a collective working on inclusive and participatory forms of curating and knowledge production, especially designed as a learning tool for students. You will find more information on the project on our website and everybody is very welcome to join us. Moreover, right before our global art history lectures, I teach a seminar on the history of curating, where precisely today we discuss the challenges of large scale exhibitions like the Documenta in Kassel or the Venice Biennale. And this finally brings me to our today's guest, Joanna Varsha, who was appointed together with Wojciech Szymanski. Um, my apologies for, of no, course, mis <laughs> mispronouncing this as curator of the Polish Pavilion at the 59th Venice Biennale next year in 2022. Joanna Warschner is Program Director of Curator Lab at the University of Arts in Stockholm and has extensive experience as curator and editor. Together with Ovul Domozoglu, she curated Die Balkone in Berlin, the third Autostrada Biennale in Kosovo, and the 12th Survival Kit in Riga. In 2013, she was one of the four curators of the Gothenburg Biennale. Her recent publications include Red Love, a reader on Alexandra Kolontai, co-edited, among others, with Maria Lind, from which we read a text as introduction to the lecture series, Furthermore, and Warren Nislowski was their guest host ghost, co-edited with Zina Nayafi in 2020. Now I would like to give the floor to Maximilian and giving him the opportunity to welcome our guest speaker as well. Thank you for the introduction. I only wanted to, to add uh, that I'm very happy to have Joanna today uh, here with us because she was uh, ready to uh, jump in very uh, late and last minute. So thank you for that again. And um, I got to know Joanna through a curatorial course I took uh, with her in, at the Tim Schwader Art Encounters two years ago. And um, later on, like uh, this year, I was very excited also to meet you at the Autostrada Biennale in Kosovo. And this actually brought me um, to thinking immediately of you uh, when conceiving this lecture series. 
because uh, there I I could uh, see like a very special uh, yeah practice of uh, of engaging uh, international artists with the local uh, environment and also what I could see. Uh, Unfortunately, only via social media was your um, Die Balkone in Berlin, where actually a very similar thing happened, where certain locations and uh, and artists were matched together. So I'm very excited to um, see what you're going to share about uh, the upcoming project today and also uh, talking about your projects that I now refer to probably. So thank you for joining us today. and. Uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation and welcome everyone. Um, I will take you on a little um, journey, one can say, uh, through the biennials because really as a curator throughout the years, uh, I can say, I guess about myself, I have become a, a biennial curator. So I never really worked in the white cubes of, um, of the protection of the walls of the institutions, but rather outside. And we all know there is a problem with biennials. And I guess many of us, I don't know how you feel when you hear the word biennial, but definitely um, biennials you know, have problematic side, but maybe also have an interesting side. So I will try to argue between both of them. Why do we actually need biennials? And um, starting from this reflection that um, I think it was Stephen Wright, uh, a writer from Canada based in Paris, who wrote some years ago, there are a, a approximately 300 biennials now in the world, you know, around 300. So if you would like to visit all of them, basically every week in the year, you could be somewhere for at the opening, which shows the scale of what the biennial culture has, you know, has become. And maybe it's worthy to ask ourselves, you know, why is it so? Why did they prof proliferate like this? Which traditions are they built? And together with, with my curating partner, Ovuldor Muzoglu, with whom we, we do many projects together, a Turkish curator also based in Berlin like me, we try to refer to, to the more optimistic side, something which <clears throat> political scientists from Vienna, actually, you might know, Oliver Marhart, calls biennials of resistance. So there are biennials and biennials, right? They're like with everything, <laughs> there are biennials and biennials. And, and there are those ones that are no liberal, that are contributing just to pseudo-democratic uh, show off of oligarchic fortunes. But there are also other biennials that really serve as educational platforms before an art institution is there that really try to introduce a more transdisciplinary, uh, pluralistic, the central approach. So I guess for us as curators, as art makers, you know, if you go to the biennial, if you uh, follow the biennial, if you make a biennial, try to answer, uh, to, to ask yourself, you know, which, what do you mean by a biennial? Which um, ontology do you situate it in? Where does it come from? um how yeah how do you how do you position yourself and how do you position the culture of biennials i will read you uh, a, just a little fragment from my reflection based on oliver marhart so somebody it's, it's from the interview that somebody is making now we are making now conversation and um with lisa rosenthal who is a little bit a colleague of mine and she also has done a lot of biennials so we are speaking about these problems with biennials so lisa is saying the idea of a contemporary art biennial has a particular history and comes with certain expectations. The first art biennials were related to the idea of the world ex expositions and an imperial desire to represent the whole world within one framework. In the 1990s, the format became associated with the ar arrival of neoliberal global culture. Is it something you have reflected about while working on the biennial format? So that was Lisa, and I'm trying to answer. There are approximately 300 biennials in the world. One could theoretically attend an opening every week, but there are biennial and biennials, biennials and biennials. The second category are more worth looking at and are called by political scientist Oliver Marhart biennials of resistance. Throughout the last 40 years, the proliferation of perennial platforms called biennials of resistance was created mostly in the global South. 
such as early Havana Biennial. So uh, for those, uh, just to picture it, as you know, first biennial was the Venice Biennial, uh, 1895. Then, then nothing, 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 nothing. Then it was San Paolo Biennial in the 50s. Then nothing, nothing, nothing. And then there was a Havana Biennial in 78. And actually, very often, what we understand by this global international uh, biennials today, it's not a model from Venice nor uh, San Paolo where you have national pavilions. It's what Havana as this peripheric biennial has brought, you know, so that's also interesting on which leg legacy are we working on. So these biennials of resistance were created mostly in global south, such as early Havana biennial, Johannesburg after the end of apartheid, or in Guangzhou after the democratic uprising in South Korea. Some of them aimed to de-westernize art canon, create another cartography, shake up legitimized institutional art, decentralize the global north, take risks and create counter hegemonic models, including, of course, the politics of history. So yes, many biennials are part of the neoliberal agenda, but many are not, or at least do a little more than that, educating, teaching, critical thinking, and we need to cultivate those ways. For biennial makers such you and I, it's important to defend the format against its takeover by the market-oriented ideology in a versatile, the linked, the centered, political, and poetic manner. And then Lisa is asking, what would you wish for the future development of biennials? How might the form be developed to reflect the needs and desires of our current moment? And I'm saying, I would generally wish from art that it does what it preaches when it says the colonization, horizontality, forms of care, that it really means it. Recently, I also realized one more thing. Museums are so much ballast. In our times, you cannot do other things than address their multifaceted problematic history and anthology. So currently, biennials could be also a good exit plan for telling other tales. So that was a, just a red fragment as an introduction to present to you the biennial that Maximilian, Maximilian visited that uh, was co-curated over the summer in Kosovo. And uh, it always helped to have some images. So I'll share, um, I'll share some pictures. And we'll start with this. Can you see it? Yeah, okay. Mm, yes, so this is an artwork mm, by uh, Agnes Dennis, a feminist environmental artist born in 1931 in Budapest, but then who emigrated for Sweden to, to the US. I really recommend for those who have not uh, known her practice to check her out because she really was a forerunner of many of the questions that we are asking ourselves today. She was, um, she was a feminist environmentalist. She, um, during the period of so-called land art, she was proposing completely different approach to, to, to art, to art making. You might be familiar with uh, the work she has realized in New York in 84 or 82, or I think between 82 and 84, called the wheat field confrontation. So basically when she proposed to cultivate a wheat field on the field uh, of Battery Park, downtown Manhattan, uh, by cultivation of, of land and also calling it confrontation, interestingly enough. And um, having her work and the fact that she has been wait, waiting you know, for a long time for recognition, uh, and in a way one can say maybe she was ahead of her time, um, and knowing that she is also stemming from, from the region uh, where the Autostrada Biennial takes place, which is West Balkans, um, Ovul and me decided to write her an email. And sometimes, um, in, in this case, it works. And we addressed her asking whether she would uh, could think of uh, a new work. First, actually, we wanted to do a wheat field, but then from this conversation came an idea to propose a new work um, for Pristina, the capital of Kosovo. And, um, and Agnes Dennis 
actually came with this very simple and very powerful idea to cultivate a sunflower field uh, in front of the youth uh, and sports palace, which is like a Yugoslav, uh, post-Yugoslav um, big center in the city, in the very center of the city that was still derelict. I'll show you some pictures and maybe introduce a little bit the context. Uh, so, how can we go forward? Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, that's this is the sunflower field. And again, would like to read you something also because it's um, <clears throat> what Agnes Dennis uh, sent us as a comment to this piece. Uh, before that, maybe just one, one, uh, one note um, that um, for those who don't know, so Kosovo, if you look at the map, uh, probably two hours flight from Vienna maximum, and yet seems very far away, but um, Kosovo is an autonomous republic, which is only recognized by half of the countries of the planet. It is at the very, very end of a former Yugoslavia. So uh, it always had a, a kind of dubious role of being like a backyard of Yugoslavia in, in some sense. Um, it's a multicultural society. It has been uh, involved in the war uh, in, before 1999 and then uh, with the NATO bombings made in, as an independent republic. And of course, it's only, uh, what is it, 99, 20 years ago. So uh, the feeling of being in a post-conflict place, in post-conflict zone is still very fresh. So obviously when you work there, you also ask yourself, can art be a form of recovery? Can art be a form of a repair? You know, and how could it be? how a language of art could potentially be maybe a seismograph of communicating with each other uh, where it's perhaps too early to use words in the whole recovery process. So of course, uh, as a curator coming from outside, you have to be extremely sensitive to those questions and it's not, nothing you can just bring with yourself. But this is how it goes. You you try to listen, you try to understand, you try to think what would be an interesting proposal as a response. And I believe this is what might be a productive conversation between a host and a guest. Because as a curator coming, of course, you are kind of a guest. But then if everything goes well, you become also a host of a person, of an organization that invites you. So Kosovo, with all its fragility, and with its unfinished process of a country building and unfinished process of just recovery, so to say, was really interesting working ground for us to, to, to ask those questions about recovery and, and repair. Uh, and this is how also our conversation with Agnes Dennis came about. This is, this is how we arrived at this idea of planting a sunflower field in the city center. So at one point we asked Agnes Dennis, could she send us a few words about this, this field? Uh, and she said, I originally became interested in sunflower, sunflowers while planting my wheat field. In doing my usual constant research, I learned that alternating planting wheat and sunflowers helps to keep the soil rich. Later, when I was invited to write an essay for a book about soil, I use this knowledge to impact the many ways we must keep this precious resource fertile. Alternating planting with one season and sunflowers the next, it will ensure the soil fertility. We accept soil and think little of its existence, but all life depends on this thin layer surrounding the globe. Sunflowers are happy plants that mean many things in different cultures. For the Chinese, they are good luck, and for the Incas, they symbolize the sun uh, god. I'm glad you are planting these sunflowers in all possible areas. It will bring pleasure and well being, as do all things that grow and live. When things grow, blossom, life is expecting its transformations and secrets. Watch, listen, participate. 
we can all be like sunflowers, nourish and endow others with our richness, turn to the sun, then reflect its warmth to all living creatures. So this is also where my title comes, We Can All Be Like Sunflowers, is, is a quote from Agnes Dennis and quote from this, from this process. And um, it was in a way a beautiful journey of when you ask yourself also what participation can mean. You know, what is a meaningful form of participation which is not, which is not extraction, which is not uh, misuse, which leaves some kind of effects after and and the simple um, action of growing something together of planting seeds you know of uh, regenerating the city center without gentrifying it that's also a very important aspect of this work um, somehow was facilitated through art and uh, you know, for me personally, it was also one of these this moments, these works that you kind of gain believe again in <laughs> what you are doing, what you are doing it, and how how art can be helpful in this process of, of, of recovery. So just to show you some pictures, yeah, this is sunflower lifespan is pretty short, so it's only like eight weeks, but um, the harvesting, you know, the the harvesting by birds, by humans and non-humans was also part of the piece. And then the collecting, collecting of the sunflowers, cleaning the field. And we were when we were cleaning the field at the beginning of September, we also realized, I don't have here pictures from this, but we also realized that it's an artwork that didn't produce one centimeter of trash. There was nothing to throw away. You know, which obviously, first of all, is important in very important Agnes Dennis work, but I guess in also our work today, it's important uh, to think about those things of carbon footprint, carbon footprint of art, for example. So that's uh, one work I wanted to introduce, then we will jump to, to Two, three more examples of, of what I mean when we speak about the biennial resistance or, or art as recovery. This is um, a gesture of uh, Agron uh, Blachori, uh, artist based in Kosovo, um, in front of the Albanian League, a museum in prison, which consists of um, asking the schools, the local schools for uh, disused chairs and making out of these chairs this kind of form of, you can tell it maybe like reverse parliament. And uh, just letting it stand there. And uh, for me, it was very powerful thinking again of a participation and on, of a democratic participation, so to say, because there is this saying that in a, a democracy, a chair should stand empty because potentially each of us could take this chair, each of us could take a role in a democratic process. And in a way, Agron uh, pushes this a little bit further because um, not only it stays empty, but it also needs to be reversed. It needs to be taken. It needs to be activated for a possible, possible collective process, which obviously in Kosovo today is also very, um, very, very important. So that's um, how it looked in the rain. There is an artwork of Alban Muya. This is an artwork of Alban Muya, an artist from Mitrovica, also from Kosovo, um, around the legacy of Yugoslav monuments and the fact that many, most of Yugoslav monuments disappeared, of course, because of the conflict, because of the past. In a way, it, this is a monument that disappeared in his hometown and he inscribed it, it reappeared in prison in another city, uh, in another scale, a little bit in the phantomatic uh, relation with the city because it almost, you know, we only see it from one perspective and it opens um, huge discussion around memorials and monuments and, and how you deal with the past that was, let's say, anti-fascist past, and yet led to the uh, to the huge conflicts. How do you deal with this dilemma? This is how it looked from the side. This is Alban. 
I make a little guided tour. For, this is uh, Evul and me at the opening. Little guided tour for you. We'll jump for certain things. This is one can say it's almost like a ready made. This is the castle of prison where we found out that in one of the rooms, which is not made open to the public, there are these archaeological excavations that the students uh, from Kosovo um, work on the archaeological excavations al along the highways that are being built. And uh, highways have been stopped because some medieval parts have been um, found. And it's a room that we dedicated to different ideas of extraction. So uh, we just um, we liked so much the display uh, of these excavations that we just asked if we could make it public and um, add the works uh, that deal also with, with forms of display as certain uh, violent gestures sometimes. So I, as, as a curators also, you, I guess we need to ask ourselves which, um, which forms of displays do we practice? How do we practice them? What do they mean? What is even a gesture of displaying? Which kind of um, emotions or tensions are uh, are inscribed in there? I'm throwing many questions at you. I hope some of them will <laughs> resonate somehow. This is Banu Chentoglu. This is a project maybe worth mentioning because of the global aspect of art. Uh, it's a project of cultural translation. So what you see here is a craftsman uh, atelier, craftsman shop, um, where an art of filigrani is being practiced. It's a very local and yet world famous method of making jewelry based on a very, very thin elements from uh, blown metal uh, and it's a workshop made by people who have been fired from a big factory of filigrani in former Yugoslavia and then decided to make a workshop together which is also open to the public so you can buy jewelry but also you can see the process and the, the, the preservation of, of the craft is also at stake and um, we asked we reached out to the uh, artist from Sao Paulo, Camila Roja, who is very much also into floral forms and botanics, uh, to enter into a kind of cultural translation dialogue because she started to send drawings of uh, plants and those plants were translated into this mode of a local jewelry. So in a way, this um, certain tropical imaginary has met or uh, arrived to this uh, way of making jewelry in in balkans and the I, we have to say that the workers they actually didn't want to they, these drawings are still there they will become kind of a permanent exhibition in in the workshop because uh, uh, it opened up an interesting uh, floral uh, dialogue and conversation between two sides she also made this kind of earrings for the city this is you you can see the her pattern that is being translated into a jewelry. This is um, another piece which um, takes a form of a dish. It's a piece by Cooking Sections, a collective which is now also nominating, nominated to Turner Prize in the UK, based in the UK, um, that deals with political politics of food and nutrition. And it's a very traditional dish that is being cooked um, through methods which are not dependent on Serbia, which are not dependent on the seeds of Serbia, which um, employ um, kind of ancient tech, local techniques uh, that goes against mono crop uh, and monopoly of certain seed making uh, that has been served. So this dish, well, it's, it's an artwork to be eaten. It has been served on daily basis, like one 
loaf of it's not really a bread although it's bread based so you can say like one loaf of this dish called flia was served on a daily basis to the uh, to the visitors that's how it's presented <clears throat> also looks at the very ancient, in its form, it, it resembles um, the form of the sun, as you can see, and the beams, or how we say the um, sh shining sun. And then there are many examples, but I will go to the artist that is very dear to me and uh, that I want to present in the second part a little bit more in detail. <clears throat> just to say that that was the headquarters of the biennial of Autostrada Biennial and is is and it's a former military hangar uh, which is also interesting because of course when you ask yourself about art as a recovery or art as a process of demilitarization um, it's tangibly has become for this organization because they were given a former German base in prison. I mean, they are renting it and renovating, not exactly given, but they are part of it. And uh, now uh, art is inhabiting uh, those places that, uh, that for many, many years in times of Yugoslavia, then in times of this conflict with Serbia and, and also in the last 20 years with NATO, where the military was stationing. This is a piece of Flaka Haliti, an artist from Kosovo based in Munich, who uh, in recent years have been making pieces based on remains from NATO camps. So she was coming to Kosovo and going to markets and she made this very lazy robots, a series of lazy robots, um, starting from the last one, going to the first one. So in reverse, in a way, using also uh, the concept of cruel optimism, and uh, we, it, she, in a way, she couldn't have thought of a better location for her last robot than a former NATO hangar. So she, she brought this, 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 this robot to its very beginning, although it's because it's the first robot and the last at the same time. It's a bit complicated, but anyhow, that's, that was like our main display in this NATO hangar. There's the lazy robot. And um, I wanted to introduce, should be coming soon, just a moment. Jumping, jumping, jumping. Yes, so to introduce, uh, and the artist with whom I'm now working on the Polish pavilion. And it's pretty new. We are really uh, excited that in this political era, uh, it was possible to win a democratic competition uh, with, with her artwork. It's Małgorzata Mirgatas, who is a Romani Polish artist based in the mountains near Zakopane in southern Poland. And uh, who I'll show you her work here in, and then I'll read, read again something. So here you can see in the middle, you can see Mogojata with her two assistants. Basically what we have presented in prison is uh, those huge banners. One of her methodology is actually to make pieces of clothing for the house or make pieces of clothing for architecture. Like we are usually used to see, you know, banners with some commercial messages, but how can art also be present in those ways? I guess that's also one of them. One of the reasons we really wanted to cover a house, to, 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 to clothe the house. And we chose this, this, this house, which is pretty well visible from the riverbank. This is the moment of the opening. And the house have been um, clothed with portraits of six uh, famous or famous for the community, maybe not generally famous, but six uh, Romani women. So the cycle is called Hair Stories. 
and she's been portraying uh, women that were dear also to her struggle as a Roma activist, but also for this transnational community. What you can see in the picture, so here you can see the Romani woman, for example, Delaine Lebas, an artist, visual artist. And uh, here you can see Mogojata, an arti the artist. And, and this is a vice minister of culture in Kosovo, who actually comes from Roma minority, from Roma community. And that was also for us so interesting to see that there are places in Europe where the Roma culture is um, structurally much more present, for example, in the governmental level than in many other countries like Austria or Poland or Germany. So uh, this work has been very much produced also with the local Romani community. This is how it looks from far. And very often Mogojata is making this um, textile, I mean, this is her method, textile painting, textile, textile as a carrier of narration. So um, when I interviewed her, it was really interesting to hear that, you know, if she wants to portrait, uh, for example, her aunt, she would take a piece of cloth from, from her aunt because this piece of cloth is carrying the energy of that person in a way. And this would be a starting point for a pot potential painting or textile banner or a patchwork that she's, make, she's been making. So in this uh, second part, I would like to introduce her work a little bit more. And so I will, I will, uh, I will, I have a, sorry, I have a other presentation for you. Here it is. Um, just a second. Yeah, right. And again, I would read uh, fragments of, of a text I wrote about her in, um, in relation to, uh, I mean, about her practice. Mm, I will read fragments of it and then I will put this, you can go through the portfolio together with me. So, <clears throat> you don't always need to present yourself as a Romani artist an organizer of a large exhibition in Poland once remarked to Małgorzata Mirgatas. Indeed, she does not need to, but expressly chooses to. Why omit this fact if her artwork, sensibilities, artistic and activist practice are all grounded in Polish Romani culture and refer to Romani women in particular? Her art is socially and politically entangled and most importantly, autonomously created within a community that is otherwise often tokenized and stigmatized. It is paraphrasing Donna Haraway and her concept of situated knowledge, a Roma situated art. This apparently innocent curatorial comment on Mirgata's work, a piece of good advice on how to wash away her ethnic coloring and avoid any associations with ethnographic museums, obviously begs a plethora of important questions relevant to our times. Who has a right to speak for whom? How can the mechanisms of exclusion, exclusion and discrimination be dismantled? How do power relations relate to representation? What is the place of native art within the canon of contemporary art? What does minority feminism in the traditional community look like? Because Malgojata actually says about herself and what she's <coughs> practicing is a minority feminism. It's Excuse me, <coughs> it's not a feminism that is only built on emancipation from your community, but the, quite the opposite. You stay from in your village and you work with this village. <coughs> Can there be a reciprocal acculturation? And if so, <coughs> how can the majority learn on the minority. I'm sorry, just a short break from my throat. <coughs> 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 
finally, can working on identity, especially one rooted in the experience of injustice, be an, an affirmative and emancipatory strategy rather than a reductionist isolating one? If so, how? Because this is also what very, I, I guess, a very strong part of, of Mogorzata's work that it has been, of course, rooted in injustice, but on the other hand, it's so positive, it's so affirmative, it's so strong in its message without victimization, in a way. <coughs> Mirka Tas was born in Zakopane in Poland, graduated from Sculpture Department in Academy of Fine Arts in Krakow. <coughs> she lives in the Roma settlement in Czarnagura in the Carpathian foothills, where she also works as an educator and activist. She's married and has two sons. She's Romani, Polish, and European. Her rich, or, <clears throat> rich ornamented, vibrant patchworks, sculptures, screens, small altars, and picture collages often depict scenes from everyday life in Roma settlements. And mainly portrayed women, their relationship, alliances, and joint activities. They also show children and animals and less often men. Mirka Tass paintings are created from fragments of different fabrics and by, as she calls it, throwing the material into the painting. Many of the fabrics sewn onto her paintings to create collages were taken directly from the wardrobes of the people depicted who are often parts of her intimate circle. They consist of bits of skirts, scarves, or shirts sewn onto curtains, drapes, bedclothes, or rugs. Shall I sell this dress, give it to someone, or do you want me? Do you want it for the painting? Her mother would often ask. The material employed literally carries history. Knowing who has worn a given article and under which circumstances is a matter of no small importance. Bearing the traces of life and use, <clears throat> Uh, the appropriated materials are infused with energy and gain a new artistic existence. The curtains become the underlying architecture of the works, <clears throat> and at the same time, the visual basis for the creation of feminist narratives about bright people and their characters. In recent years, Mirga Taz has created many works about important women in her life, building an effective archive of Romani hair stories. This feminine genealogy consists, for example, of small altars dedicated to, dedicated to four of, of her relatives. <clears throat> the painting sisters, I don't know if this painting will be here, just like a sisters. Yeah, those are the small altars. <clears throat> the painting sisters presents four women. The first is hanging a sweatshirt, displaying a card playing motif upon a line to dry. The second woman is braiding with rapt attention, what seems like an endless rope. And the third one is appraising a patchwork cloth upon which the fourth woman is sewing. The fabric becomes a curtain, a tapestry, a laundry, something like a flying carpet or perhaps a screen. It all merges into a communally shared camouflage akin to a protective coat of sorts. In Russia and Scandinavia, early women organization had their genesis in associations like weaving workshops or sewing clubs, which allowed women to engage in politics and to campaign by taking part in certain emancipatory practices under the guise of their involvement in traditionally accepted feminine activities. With Mirka Tass, the impulse toward change, education and fighting stigmatization is perhaps comparable yet different. Instead of achieving social gains through self-denial, <clears throat> what is endangered here springs from the affirmation of the self, from a grounded desire to practice these feminine activities. As to emphasize and even perform one's own identity. This is not achieved by confronting, uh, conforming to the expectations of any appraising voice from outside, but rather by constructing new positive models of transnational community that refer references specific ornaments, colors, and history. We'll jump a little bit here. And this also activist uh, 
In her former eclectism, Małgorzata artworks also evoke an idea of a femage, a concept coined in the late 70s by Miriam Shapiro and Melissa Meyer, both American artists associated with the second wave of feminism. The mash was born from various driving forces and it's most famously associated with the slogan such as the personal is political and with efforts made to reclaim the authorship of works by women that over the course of centuries had constantly been falsely attributed to men. It is likewise associated with appeals now still strictly, uh, now still contemporary from the blurring of borders and asymmetries between so-called native and professional art. The femage combines collage, assemblage, photo massage, and other similar techniques, both in traditional communities and in contemporary art. Mirgata's femage also has an ecological dimension. I will maybe put some of her femage again, like so for you to see. Ecological dimension, uh, introducing fabrics and materials that would otherwise end a waste back into that would otherwise end as a waste back into circulation. Even during my studies, I was running all over Krakow searching for wasted paper and boxes. Instead, artist sculptures are made primarily of cardboard and wax. We had also some sculptures here before. Just as the activist movements of Say Her Name or Say Their Name seek to raise awareness around the Black victims of police brutality in the United States by placing the emphasis on telling the stories of specific people rather than treating them as statistics, so does Mirgatas present names and affirm a circle of women who are important both to herself and her community. She builds up models that juxtapose tradition, ornamentation, patchworks, and small altars with emancipatory politics. The optimism of Mirgata's work comes from her way of being a realist who responds to the mechanisms of both exclusion and self-exclusion with sisterhood and internationalism. The language she employs to overgrow, overthrow anti-Ziganist stereotypes reflects a determination to affirm and build positive paradigms through art, which is the inverse of the pornography of poverty proffered by the media and the fetish of exhibiting impoverished Roma settlement. Feminism in Mirgatar's work and activism stems from a subjective emancipatory story wherein autonomy, the recording of women's genealogies, the practice of sisterhood, as well as a conscious rooting in Romani identity and culture, her first and foremost embodied ideas and only later theoretical concepts. Similar strategies who pursued, among others, Katarina Taikon, who sometimes referred, is referred to as Martin Luther King of Sweden, was an activist, actress, and writer, and the author of a series of children books about the little Roma girl Katizzi. I had an opportunity to encounter Mirgata's work for the first time at the Art Encounters Biennial in Timisoara. So this is where we met with Maximilian. That was such an important moment for me because <laughs> maybe you also remember the encounter of <clears throat> with my um, Malgojata uh, screens, which were here at the beginning, those, those screens. The Romanian region of Banat, which was the political and cultural context in which the exhibition took place, and still vivid concept of Middle Europa and its ethnic and cultural diversity encouraged me to see it as an affirmative opposition to the homogeneity and national rhetoric prevalent in Central and Eastern Europe. Personally, I do not like to describe myself as a Polish curator. If necessary, I would rather say I'm a curator who comes from Poland, a country that fortunately is becoming increasingly inhabited by nationalities that do not necessarily identify as Polish. However, I felt pride in seeing that the work of Mogorzata Mirgatas was being featured in Romania as that of a Romani as well as Polish artist. For her, these two adjectives belong to processing the material of intercultural identity. Sorry for my throat problems, <coughs> too much talking lately, but uh, yeah, I guess, this is where I would end and uh, and turn it into hopefully into a conversation. I will stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, as we did last time, I now uh, 
uh, activated the possibility to unmute yourselves again so uh, that anyone who has questions also can jump in right away. But I was interrupting Ilaria, who was also unmuting herself at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, thank you so much. It was such a rich um, presentation. I enjoyed it really a lot. And uh, there were so many issues that we also discussed uh, before here with the students, but also within my seminar today. And yeah, you, you proposed so many interesting solutions to huge problems. <laughs> Uh, or at least maybe not solutions, but uh, really interesting uh, alternatives um, uh, that we tried also to tackle a little bit in the seminar today. Uh, yeah, but and uh, have, wants somebody to join the conversation right now or make an, a, a question or a note that, to share with us? I have a question if uh, this is um, like the, stu the students are curators mostly or how does it look? Maybe the students can <laughs> speak for themselves. When you ask a general question, nobody yeah, yeah, is yeah. possible to answer. So. Hello. Hello. Um... I'm Leila. Uh, I'm from Georgia, working for art gallery there, so mostly curating in the art gallery. Uh, but uh, if I know it properly, uh, you've been curating Georgia's pavilion on Venice Biennale, comic <laughs> Adelogia uh, mm -hmm. uh, with Gio Sumbaz and so on. And I, uh, this. Uh, um, uh, listening you was very interesting for me because uh, the activism in art is very interesting and open question in Georgia too. So we have to do a lot in this direction. And it was very interesting for me to look at um, uh, Biennale's like artistic and social activisms also, if I'm expressing correctly. Mm. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, <clears throat> I guess it's important to thank you for your comment and, and nice words, but I think it's important to think of, um, you know, what is uh, ethically re ethical relation between art and activism, how they can work together in a way that they empower each other and not disempower, right? Because they easily there can be a lot of um, hurt feelings on both sides, and especially on activist side. And, um, but I guess there are moments in which actually the, the work that activists are doing in much more, <clears throat> very often long-term sustain sustainable manner, tedious manner uh, than artists can be still amplified by art. And I guess for maybe for us as curators, it's one of the, um, one of the challenges you know, how can you kind of balance, how can you mediate and how can you uh, work with those two sides that they, that they do much more good to each other than harm to each other. So I guess that's one of my guiding questions. Uh, the remark about uh, victimization or not victimization was very interesting for me because uh, sometimes uh, art is depicting, describing is more descriptive of uh, the political or social um, uh, issues and uh, it's always hard to um, it's, it's always hard to uh, find this balance yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. In between. Yeah, maybe uh, going a little bit uh, more into the detail of first uh, to answer your questions. So we have here a mixed audience. So we have students that study philosophy and art history, uh, but we also have now here uh, incomings. Um, 
as you just heard. <laughs> and they are also um, uh, have uh, curatorial experiences as mm -hmm. our students have also, not totally, not entirely, but I would say some of them. So it's a kind of mixed mm -hmm. theory and practice. Uh, yeah, but basically our course is on uh, a bachelor in art history, philosophy and culture and Kulturwissenschaften. Mm. So with this uh, background. Um, but what I like very much about your talk in, in the first place or in the first part um, was this uh, different positions that you showed from the Autostrada Biennale uh, and tackling several problems that we discussed today, for example, how to avoid uh, the white cube situation. And I think you saw you show really interesting examples. And the second is um, how to yeah, make a, uh, uh, the local positions work within the globalized art world. I mean, this is like the huge question of the whole lecture series uh, and the positions you showed um, were very interesting to me, for example, Mm, this kind of sculpture um, who dealt with the uh, Yugoslavian past, the memories, <laughs> sculptures that how to deal with this kind of difficult past. And you showed so many examples of dealing with local um, traditions and issues. Uh, I, in a, in a very sensitive way, because this maybe goes back also to the question from Leila with the activism. So how can we balance this kind of very critical situation between the local and the global? Mm. Because in the end, I mean, you curated a Biennale, which in this very yeah, critical, this critical past, so you can't overcome this, uh, and on the other hand, you have to deal with it. But on the other hand, I mean, it's still a biennale that presents itself on, on the world, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe has also the opportunities for the artists to, to present themselves on this stage in a way. Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess, you know, to, to get a little bit... Um, making of of this process was that when Avul and me traveled to, to Kosovo, of course, you have this, you know, studio visits and meetings. And luckily, our organizers also made a lot of meetings with people who are not artists, but activists. And there are many activists in Kosovo, actually. Um, and we had so many interesting conversations. And then we thought that these conversations, which marked us even more than some artworks, could be a, a way how to build the whole biennial. So basically, you know, you would hear from a water activist about uh, contamination of water. And we, we started to think how this fight against the contamination of water could be potentially not only amplified, but responded to by art. You know, how can art also be part of this larger discussion? So. Um, we played very much with this role that you are a host, you are sorry, you are a guest, so you have host, you're a guest, but your role is to become uh, a host in the name of the guest. You know that you again you have to negotiate this balance like between host and guest. And um, and I guess if you do it ethically and if you do it sensibility, you don't need to ask yourself about this global and local. It just happens. You know, you just have to think about those two sides. You have to think about your role as a guest and also as your role as a host, because what is demanded from you is actually to host others there, right? Mm -hmm. And this have those two things in, in the picture and follow your gut feeling uh, also. It's very important. <laughs> Yeah, which I, uh, also I like very much that you pointed out that um, 
this uh, proliferation of Biennale is, is nothing bad and nothing to fear because in theory or theoretical uh, approaches, we try to overemphasize, you know, everything is like bad globalization. And I think you showed really nicely uh, how this can also be really interesting alternatives. But now you, you, um, you again face uh, the Biennale setting, mm, yes. <laughs> which is quite the opposite, or it's not so clear what it is in the end. I mean, the Biennale had such a long history and uh, so, so many interests, so many political, economic uh, driven interests um, in this kind of uh, large scale show. Um, uh, did you, I don't know why, uh, I mean, you said that you are really super happy that this happened, that you couldn't imagine that this to happen. So um, do you choose uh, Margot Jata's work by purpose? Because you imagine that in the setting of the Biennale, it could be like a resistant or resilient mm -hmm. artwork to the spectacle. Well, you know, it's very important, I think, that art is part of a larger uh, problems we go through as society and the larger issues that the society deals with. It's, uh, I guess, for me as a curator, I guess for many of us, it's, it's important to be part of a larger picture. It's not about somebody's exhibition only. It's about what it stands for, what does it communicate, how can it empower, affirm things, certain issues and values we stand for. So. For me, it was, uh, I mean, since I've seen the work of Małgorzata in Romania, actually in Timisoara, and I have to say, I didn't know her before. And I, you know, I'm a curator from Poland that I thought I know all artists in Poland, more or less. I mean, not all, obviously, but you know, all many good artists. And so for me, it was also a shock that I'm uh, under informed about uh, such an amazing um, artist coming from Roma community. And since I, I saw her work, I wrote her immediately and in a way also later approached her and made this interview. And, you know, it's just a question of um, chemistry also that you've, I felt, and I, I guess I hope also she did too, but it's more important like that I, I saw an, in her this totally integral artist. It's an artist for me that stands for so many things at the same time. So she's... Uh, obviously first of all fighting for uh, you know anti-stigmatization of this largest minority in Europe which is a Roma minority and as we know living still very tokenized still very very much on the margins and she actively with her art is part of <clears throat> reversing this process she is uh, uh, extremely uh, you know visual and interesting artist in, in her methods of feminization of using this traditionally feminist craft or ethnographical craft and, and making place for native art. She's also a very hardworking woman and mother. And this is also very important how she works with her community as an activist, how she uh, uses the community as a resource and gives back to the community. So on so many levels, I just like fell in love with her, so to say, as a curator, you know? And uh, so it was, I mean, you can say it was also a strategy, but it's not only, it's more than a strategy. It's just a feeling that that's the right voice, you know, now to propose in Poland. And I approached her, but she said that she already is working with this other curator. And then she said, I, I only work with two curators. And by now she's saying this, that she only works with two curators, with Wojtek, who is this art historian from Krakow that I didn't know before and, uh, and me, and she paired us. So this is also interesting that we are not like, curators coming and saying, you will be our artist. No, but she is an artist. She's saying, I like to work with you and you. So you have to get on well together because you are going to work with me together, you know? So she reversed also this power balance that is often between curator and artist because as curators, very often we come, you know, we live on art, we depend on art. And yet very often we perform some kind of paternalistic approach to artists. We have to be very conscious and, and careful about those things. And I. I liked very much that she kind of said, no, you are going to work with this guy if you want or not. If you want to work with me, this is your, you know, this is the, this is the, our triangle, so to say. Yeah, wonderful. This would be my next question. So um, uh, 
uh, in a way you al already answered it, um, how your process, for example, now for the Biennale is development. So how, what's your part? What is her part? How, how does it effectively then to set up the pavilion, the exhibition, how does it work? Hmm. Well, so we, um, it's definitely a lot of work for her. Uh, you know, much more because normally, you know, in, when you're a biennial curator, like in Autostrada, I mean, you are in charge of everything, of all these projects. And here it's very one very big project of Mongorzata. So, of course, it's a lot of work for her and we support her and work with her as much as we can. But um, I can't yet, I mean, I can tell you little things how we are working and we are also very excited about this. So we are going next week to Ferrara which is a city in Italy, where there is this very, um, you are art historians, you might know, uh, Palazzo Schifanoia. It's a palazzo that Abby Warburg wrote about and liked very much, and also other scholars wrote about this palazzo. It's a palazzo where you see very tangibly the migration of images between cultures, between Indian culture, Greek culture, Roma culture, Italian Renaissance, etc. cetera. Uh, some of those symbols that are presented in Palazzo Schifanoia stem from uh, Romani culture too, like for example, tarot cards, mm -hmm. the cards of tarot. I mean, car tarot cards are also intercultural, but they're associated with Romani culture. But obviously, Abi Warburg didn't write about Roma culture because there is a huge invisibility generally in the art history of uh, with Roma culture. Uh, so what this is our starting point. The Palazzo Schifanoia is our starting point, and Palazzo Schifanoia has more or less the same dimensions as a Polish pavilion. And we are going to rewrite the Palazzo Schifanoia. I mean, Małgorzata is going to redraw, re, you know, retextile uh, Palazzo Schifanoia through the Romani lens, both historical and present. And uh, this is wonderful because then we have also this echo on a canonical art history. So it's not mm. just the exhibition, but also the backlash on, on the theoretical side super interesting in a way yes and i think this is also why you know in this right-wing poland now um i mean thanks to this art historical component i guess this jury that is 50 50 you know 50 right wing 50 left wing also which uh, voted for that project uh, probably because of the renaissance aspect which is fair enough you know like many people see different <laughs> different things <laughs> which shows only that this uh, art is so multi-layered Mm, clever. <laughs> and uh, do you do you expect some some reaction from from Polish media or government? Are you afraid? Well, no, no, I'm not afraid because I guess now when we won this competition, I mean, unless something really unpredictable happens, um, we already have a contract. You know, we are realizing this concept. So. Uh, I don't think there will be any censorship at this point. At the end, there is still the pretension of democracy in Poland. I mean, <laughs> pretending. So. so good luck with it. Um, but yeah, I would like to invite uh, questions or comments. Jens? <clears throat> Jens Besser has raised his hand. And I have to turn on the microphone, I'm sorry. <laughs> do, you, do you listen to me? Yeah. OK. Um, I have a question. You're talking about the Biennale of Resistance. And uh, resistance, in my eyes, is a quite strong word. And how do you deal, actually, with the situation uh, being maybe financed um, by bigger sponsors, and you still feel that you are resistant? Uh, or that you are kind of a revolutionary part or do you also implement some parts where you work without permissions to realize a certain topic because maybe the sponsor doesn't want to pay for that project do we have something like that inside sometimes or not mm -hmm. right thank you yeah so a biennale of resistance by biennale of resistance i meant certain genealogy of biennales i'm not saying that venice biennale is biennale of resistance i guess it's not oh. however you can try to resist within the structure for sure and you always should i guess as a curator to a degree but biennales of resistance is the genealogy of the biennials that were built 
on resisting uh, the institutional art world as was known by that time. So Havana Biennial said, we are not going to invite people from the global north. We are only going to be a peripheral biennial. And that was a resistance to what was the mainstream of art, you know, or recognition. Mm -hmm. So this is how certain biennials thought of themselves as platforms that can resist um, visibility of sorts or hegemony, hegemony of sorts. And that was before uh, these exhibitions like Les Magiciens de la Terre that were first time presenting the artwork, you know, from Africa or Global South, etc. So uh, I do believe that the Autostrada Biennial where I was invited is a biennial of resistance. I really do believe it because I, it's a biennial that it's based, it's, it's initiated by free uh, artists uh, um, in Kosovo that really in the bottom up process starts to create, start to create a platform in which art becomes this language where you can gain craft, you can gain critical thinking, you can feel less isolated because it's a country where you need a visa to go anywhere. So in this sense, you resist the reality that has been you know, geopolitically imposed upon you. Um, and uh, finally, I guess as a curator, you know, sometimes I'm using this quote of Nora Stenfeld, a colleague curator, and she said that you have, you are in a way, you are an activist and a policeman at the same time. And I, I feel like this sometimes. A police woman, you know, sometimes you are really, like, on one hand, you are really uh, putting forms, orders, protocols. On the other hand, you can never, you should never forget the activist part and the part that, yes, if if you really believe in the project, obviously go ahead, don't ask for a permission and just make it happen in the name of some larger idea, of course, and not just to make it, you know, just to make you feel better. But if this is for, for something you believe uh, is, um, you know, value to follow, I would say, yes, absolutely do it. And, and I think it's important to, to keep this spirit and being able to do this. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I wanted to maybe jump in, in in a completely different direction because you you were mentioning the um, uh, the relation between between kind of craftsmanship and uh, what is considered native art maybe and uh, and the field of contemporary art and actually in in what you did in in Kosovo and also now working with Magosha uh is again like like. Uh, you are dealing a lot with uh, what was some time ago still considered as margins of art, and maybe maybe not really um, so much in the in the center of uh, contemporary art. But currently, in a lot of exhibitions, uh, we see these combinations and confrontations. So I just wanted to to ask you about um, how you see this relation, because you had uh, even in your examples now you you showed quite different um, approaches on how to combine these things, like from the Filigrani um, workshop where, where actually a translation happens to, um, to, to Margoshata's work where uh, um, like, uh, it's all about the, how, the, how the craftsmanship is used and, and how it goes into the, uh, into the work itself. So I, I just wanted to, to ask you uh, how you, <laughs> how you would position those uh, those fields to each other mm -hmm. yeah it's a bit complex question and i have to do my homework also <laughs> a lot uh, you know in the head of venice um, you know i think so i'm interested also in this activist part of craft craft in a way so when what was a little bit in my text when I was studying Alexandra Kolontai with my students, I realized that in Sweden there were this um, sewing, sewing, uh, sewing workshops as a cover for political activity because feminine, feminine activity of getting together and making some sewing was um, looking innocent enough as a gathering, and under this innocence, political act activity has been born. 
you know so i'm interested in this um, tension between something that can have an one appearance and yet uh, be very productive politically and craft certain idea of craft i guess offers this very much um but i'm also in um, like with the translation project of camila roja in filigrani very much of the opinion that uh, as Ahil member is saying, we have to border each other. We cannot. We have to be um, conscious of not falling into some kind of dogmatic essentialism. That there is only one identity, one way of doing things, and craft stands for this. I guess <clears throat> it's very important for us as curators, again, who are mediators to a degree, to try out forms where yes, a craft, a botanical tropical craft from Brazil can meet. A local filigrane uh, technique, and but what is and but your responsibility as a curator is ask how can it happen that again those things uh, um, have a match in a way you know using the dating language but that they they that they that they empower each other in some sense, or that they are curious about each other, that they border each other. This is what Ahil member is saying. We have to border each other. We cannot just create borders between each other. We need to border each other. So how can how can a tropical botany uh, border filigrane? I guess those uh, craft is a language that offers bordering, definitely. So this I'm interested in the, that direction of craft. Maybe I can uh, join uh, another tiny question. No, just kidding. Uh, about <laughs> art. <laughs> now, what uh, came to my mind, uh, or I always have in mind when, you know, uh, thinking about curating or curators, um, it came also to my mind uh, when you showed the display of the archaeological findings. Uh, and also this match between, which is beautiful, craftsmanship and, and this botanical studies from Brazil, which is really beautiful. But um, in a way, the process of curating then produces the artwork. So you well, yes, I mean, if it's a commission, if it's new artwork, you are part of obviously you play a very big role and uh, definitely it's a fun part of curating. <laughs> yeah, but you um, I mean, this pretty intense, right? So you 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 go into the position of of the artist a little bit. I mean, you're part of it. You don't go to the position of the artist, but you are part of the equation. You are part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes, you are executing this kind of host guest relationship. Uh, and I guess, <clears throat> speaking of ecological aspect, I mean, this is a lot of work, a lot of negotiation, but actually I like this negotiation. So I like this part of work, but if you want to make a biennial of resistance, I guess you also have to think about where uh, resources are going. And ideally they should not go to insurance and transport, but rather to support artists, craftsmen. So those are the forms you have to go into because if you if you just want to bring 20 drawings from Brazil, of course you can, but this will cost 20,000 euros. But you can spend 5,000 on making much more you know, engaging project based not on original drawings, but their copies that you know, they're uh, made um, or amplified for the jewelry. So you need to think on, on many levels and, and sustainability and also ecosystem of art and where the resources are going and how are also very important. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But at the end, it has to feel right. You know, if, if you are a curator for whom it feels right just to make an exhibition from drawings, original drawings, just follow this because, I mean, not everybody has to work like uh, in that model. It's just one of possible models. And I, I mean, thinking in, in that scale would then also me, mean that uh, your choice of, uh, of the surrounding, um, because, because with all the artworks that you showed, uh, in, in any case, the specific site of it uh, was actually part of the, of, 
how the perception of this artwork is in the is shaped in the end. So so that uh, would would even make you more part of the of the artistic uh, creation than uh, than only intervening in the discussions around uh, how it is produced in the end. Yeah, I mean, yes, you are part of the picture, definitely. Mm -hmm. Very much. And sometimes the, but you know, in White Cube, we also make a decision of location. Mm -hmm. It just feels more neutral, but it isn't actually. It's equally charged. I, I, I would say it's uh, like it's it's more more difficult to do it in the White Cube because it's uh, it's uh, like, like it feels so neutral, but any any decision on, on how it's, uh, how you um, position it differently then makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And I think um, by like, like when I see uh, all the examples that you showed today, again, it, it made so clear to me how the um, positioning of uh, artwork towards a certain context um, just, just becomes a vehicle of, of thought just to like, uh, so, so you can start uh, of something if, if you are a visitor of the Biennale um, to, to start thinking about it. And, um, and in the end, I was wondering whether this uh, concept of curating then will, will also, uh, or is possibly translatable to the, to the Biennale Pavilion, because there uh, people are used to sometimes not thinking too much of, of the location itself and then uh, mm. and then maybe your your complex decision of taking the palazzo and then uh, uh, translating it uh, might again be a decision of uh, of context and and trying to to put that like to emphasize more strongly that one one thinks of of the context where it is presented mm. Yes, sure. I mean, in the when you work in Venice, I guess, you know, when I worked for the Georgian Pavilion, I realized some basic things like there are pavilions that are in Giardini <laughs> and there are those who are in the city. And uh, this is a fundamental difference, of course, of visibility, priority and everything, money, etc. So uh, that's why also we built the Georgian Pavilion was called Kamikaze Loggia and we build it on the roof of Arsenale. So it was like an added element, like an extension to the, to the building, which was in a way an impossible fact because it's absolutely forbidden to build anything new in Venice. As you know, Venice is a city where you cannot build one centimeter of anything new. And yet in the name of art, we, we managed to build this pavilion on the roof Mm, and add an element to the existing architecture and yet add, add a pavilion which is not following so much this logic of posh white cubes or big palazzos yeah but kind of subverted to a degree so mm, yeah i mean this you know it's just instinctual and i think it's naive not to think about all these other things you know you have to you don't need to work with all of them, but at least you have to ask yourself some questions about all the layers in which you are finding yourself as a curator. Wonderful closing remarks. <laughs> Any additional questions or comments? Nope. I don't see any. No. Me neither. So we have the pleasure to thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. It was really great to talk with you, to see your work, right? Jump into your work. And uh, yeah, thank you again. And uh, hopefully meeting in Venice. Mm, right. Yes. Next year <laughs> in presence without any other difficulties. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone for, for participating, listening in. And yeah, see you and say hi when uh, you come to Venice. Okay, thank you. We will, thank you. <laughs> okay, bye, good bye night. Bye.